Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Rich Campbell. And this is the last of the NDC Sydney sessions. The crew that was live streaming is packing up quietly, quietly. as we do this. <laughs> and there's just a few people hanging out with us. But one of them is Agustinus Nalwan. And we're going to be talking about AI and the singularity, which I know that... Uh, certainly a topic of my alley. We might just have to tag the show as a geek out. I don't know what's going to happen. Let's find out. Yeah, it's cool. Anyway, uh, before we can do that, we have this little thing called Better Know Framework. Awesome. All right, dude, what do you got? Well, have you ever wanted to write your own operating system? Nope. I mean, really? Really, no. Come on. Really, really. And deep in your heart. Deep in my heart, absolutely not. No. <laughs> right. But what if I did, Carl? What if what? I did? Well, what if you did? <laughs> There's a great t- tutorial on GitHub. <laughs> you know, what's really funny is when I first interviewed Scott Hansman for .NET Rocks, and it was like episode eight. Or yeah, something. way back in the day. Yeah. This is when he thought podcasting sucked. And right. He didn't want to do anything. Yeah. I was really impressed because in college, he wrote an operating system in like C Sharp or something. I think it was C Sharp. Maybe it might was, not have been C Sharp. Yeah, I don't think he was in college then. Yeah, no, but I do remember him saying that he wrote an operating system right. in college and that he wanted, maybe that was it. He wanted to try it again in C-Shot. Anyway, somebody's going to re- listen to this show and correct sure. me. But I was really impressed that he actually wrote an operating system mm-hmm. as an ex- exercise, right? So this is an OS tutorial on GitHub and it's how to create an OS from scratch. And the guy says, I have always wanted to learn how to make an OS from scratch. In college, I was taught how to implement advanced features like pagination semaphores, memory management, but I never got to start from my own boot sector. Nice. Two, college is hard, so I don't remember most of it. And three, I'm fed up with people who think that reading an already existing kernel, even if small, is a good idea to learn operating systems. So, so there you go. If you want to, if you, you know, so some project. people do summer reading, yeah. you know, others write operating there systems. There you go. I love it. I am oh. definitely in the summer reading camp myself. <laughs> okay. That's but, fair. Uh, Anyway, this is show 1591, so you can get there by going to 1591.pwop.me. Awesome, dude. Yeah, so who's talking to us today? Uh, Somewhat in honor of our host, uh, Adam Kogan, Mm -hmm. you know, who's sort of taking care of us. We've been sharing space with SSW and so forth. Mm -hmm. We did a show with him fairly recently, 1574, called The Nine Nights of Azure. Yeah, it was great. It was a great show. It was SRAC from August, and it got a ton of cool comments. Yeah. And while they may not be terribly applicable to AI-related topics, this particular comment amused me enough that I thought I really should read it and hook Mark up with the copy of music to go by. This is Mark Russi who says, I like the concept of the Nine Nights of Azure and I really love the name. I think it would make a great title of a book. Hmm. My only concern is that there's so much to know about each one of the nine that I'm not quite sure you could ever hope to have more than a high level understanding of each of them. When you think about it, we really only talked hmm. about nine features hmm. of Azure and there's 60, 70 and there's only four horses of the apocalypse, so yeah. five of them aren't going to have anything to ride. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Whatever will they do? We'll get them goats. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's one uh, of those shows, is it? Yep. Adam <laughs> alluded to the idea that it's almost impossible to be a, quote, true full-stack developer anymore, and I totally agree. Hmm. Full-stack is such a relative concept. Yeah. But, you know, we're getting into a diversity in our development these days yeah. that I think is quite profound and not a bad thing, right? We just, we're able to do more and more. And, and certainly I, you know, I looked at this with an eye to artificial intelligence. You know, they've talked about the last algorithm mm. and this, maybe that program is ending. I simply don't subscribe to it. I'm mm-hmm. willing to be persuaded otherwise, mm. but at the same time, I appreciate Mark's sentiments that it's like, yeah, it's getting big out there. Yeah. There's lots to do. So, Mark, thank you so much for your comment. A copy of Music to Code By is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code By, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Google Plus and Facebook. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code By. And definitely follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet. We ride him side saddle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Strange. It is strange. Strange but true. All right. Well, let's bring Goose on here. And he likes to be called Goose, but his name is Agustinus Nalwan. Passionate in technology innovation to make people's life easier. And with over 20 years of experience in software development, Goose has been working in various industries from 3D animation, games development, desktop software, mobile apps, and very recently, 
computer vision, and artificial intelligence. Well known for unorthodox ways of solving difficult problems, Goose is currently the head of AI at car sales? Yes. Car sales. Like buy a car. car yep, sales. just like eBay, but for cars. No. There you go. Inventing yep. and building many cool AI projects such as Cyclops Image Recognition. So it's good to know when the Cyclops is around. So you can <laughs> go out on your night of Azure and yep. well, I don't know. So tell me about that. What's that so all about? Cyclops is an image recognition that we built in house. Mm -hmm. What it does is really, if you pass a photo of a car, right, it will tell you what is the make model body series down to the trim level. Oh, wow. Good. So yep. really detailed it does. recognition yes. of cars. Yep. yep. So only just one single shot of the photo. Wow. And so you take, wait a minute, you use a high resolution cam, you read the VIN number off the dash. No, nope. yeah. it's <laughs> nothing to do with the ratio recognition, okay. VIN, nothing at all. It's just wow. based on the look, right? And wow. you don't need a high res photo. All it needs is just 640 by 640 resolution. Okay. Wow. Yep. We knew this about computer vision that lower resolution photos are better because yep. you know, there's more generalization happening, right? You don't, you don't get tripped up by details. So all it needs is just distinguished features. And as right. long as that feature is visible within that resolution, that's right. all it needs. And they can just be color differences, yes. really. I mean, that's all you're looking for. Exactly. Yes, yes. Hmm. Yeah, cool. I think especially when you get to stuff like trim levels and things, it, mm. it may or may not be visible in the photo. Like if I've taken a head-on shot of a car and the only way you distinguish a trim level is the kind of rim it's got, mm -hmm. okay, you know, you can't actually commit miracles. Exactly. But, so it's not, uh, it's not like a magician, like what you yeah. said. It has to have a visual difference. But something interesting when we build this, when we test it, we have like a bunch of researcher, a mm -hmm. car researcher, which every day looking at the car model. Right. And then trying to write down a description of what it looks like, what is a new thing with this new model. They try to break Cyclops. Interestingly, oh, they, really? They're, yep, they're yep. banging at it. Yep. They actually bring up two photos, right? One is a Holden Colorado, and the other one a Holden Trailblazer, I remember, the latest model. Mm. Okay, uh -huh. these are Australian cars. Australian car, yeah. yep. And one is SUV. Mm. The other one is a Ute, right? Right. So from the front, you cannot really tell the difference. It looks identical from the front. Right, mm. right? right, yeah. The Ute is like a small pickup. Exactly. Oh, okay. It's got, yes. a, it's got a yes. bed in the back. Exactly. From the front, you cannot tell. So he, they, they bring up this two photo, which is the front part of the car, these right. two cars, right? And pass it to Cyclops. Cyclops identified correctly. And we all shock. They yeah. also shock as well. They bring up another 10 photos of each. It huh. got it nine out of 10 correct. Okay. And we were like, ah. But the people couldn't do this near as well. People couldn't find it. So he's like, what did the AI see? Exactly. Yeah. So we stare on the photo, every single one of them, for nearly half an hour. Finally, we find out the difference. One of them has adjustable headrest on the back middle seat. And by default, it's lowered. The other one is, <laughs> well, the other one is not adjustable. It's always up, right? Wow. You know, I've had this conversation recently yep. about DARPA's initiative of called Explainable AI. Yep. And one of the whole points was that these particular sort of black box neural net yes. models, yes. it's very hard to find out why. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you guys figured it out just by looking at it long enough to say, this is the only distinction we can find. Maybe that's it. Exactly. You're, you're actually mm. quite right. The problem with the current AI is very difficult to debug. Right. It makes mm. decisions, but we don't know how it makes decisions. Yeah. Right. There's no way to ask, hey, how do you come up with this? There is a way, but it's very hard. So what you do is actually you debug the, the layers of the neural network. Right. Mm. You find that because it's all just mathematical equation at the end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a giant mathematical equation that came up with the answer probability of this image to be Honda Civic or, or Toyota Corolla or something else, right? Mm -hmm. If you debug them, you will find that one of the variable is the one actually uh, contribute the most of that probability. Mm. Then you can find out why, why it is actually giving so much contribution, what features it's looking at. Right. So you can do this, but it's so hard to do. Because yeah, it's not well labeled or anything. Um, you literally are looking at it. Inside there are millions of variables. <laughs> right, right. Wow. That's the problem. <laughs> yes. I definitely feel like we're going to need to do some machine learning to understand this machine learning. That's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Getting meta yes. already, I mean, aren't Yes, yes. So the singularity. Yes. This is uh, something that I know that Richard's totally into this idea, mm -hmm. of downloading ourselves into well, a how computer do, or something. How do you describe a singularity? Singularity, yeah. as the name implies... It's basically a technology that you build once, right? And then it will automatically improve itself without our interaction. Okay. It's getting mm -hmm. smarter and smarter without our involvement. So mm -hmm. that's what singularity is. While our current technology is not singularity because we want to solve something new, we have to build a solution for it sure. specifically. So that's what the singularity is. 
And a lot of AI practitioner is actually dreaming about building one. Right. And this is the, the master algorithm mindset. Exactly. They, all of these things. Is yes, like, yes. At some point, we hit the perfect program that will do whatever we need it to exactly. do. Exactly. So, yes. you know, if I can put on my tinfoil hat for a second, to yeah. borrow a kind of <laughs> phrase from you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that scares most people is that, you know, we just talk through this scenario where an AI discovered something and found something, but we don't know how it did it. Yes. And now we're going to give these things the autonomy to tweak themselves and to build themselves out and to make themselves smarter. And things will happen and behaviors will occur that we don't know how they did it. We don't know why they did it. And nobody did anything to prevent it. Exactly. That's what people scare the most. Yeah. However, here's another talk. As long as it, it can get smarter, doesn't matter. As long as it doesn't have a way to actually reach the physical world. Sure. Yeah. Then it's all self-contained. But I mean, look at the systems that are running stocks and Wall Street and all of that stuff. You know, many people say the last financial crisis happened because these machines just made split second mm. decisions without any checks and balances. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure it's because they started lending money they didn't actually well, have. Well, that, that is true. That is true. But I mean, the cascade effects yeah. happen so fast. We've absolutely had flash crashes mm -hmm. on the market Yeah, that turned out to be runaway software. Yeah. But that is not artificial intelligence. It's not self-learning. Those were for no other reason than we actually always have figured out exactly what went wrong, mm -hmm. right? And it, yes. and it was a programmer's mistake. You remember the story that Doug Seven told us? I think it was the company was yes. called Knight, where they had a one defective machine in the cluster that was making bad trades. And yeah. it basically took the whole company down yeah. in, in a matter of hours by making these bad trades. Like it was an architectural mistake, yeah. not yes. a software mistake. I think that's a very different creature from You're absolutely from this. right. And, and it is unfair to say that. However... With the combinations of programming mistakes and falsely given autonomy, you know, to do things that we didn't anticipate them doing, yep. It, it, yep. we do have to be very careful. Exactly. So one thing you've got to be careful when you're building AI is you've got to give it a constraint. Yeah. Because if you just give it a goal, I want you to solve this problem without giving the constraint, it just take any shortcut to get there. Yeah. Sure. Those are the things that actually we have to worry the most mm. because mm. those shortcuts may actually harm us. Yeah. In order to achieve that goal, maybe we have to kill these three people. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's the thing that we have to care the most. Well, I mean, I mean, I like your example of Cyclops because the worst it can do is misidentify a car. Exactly. Right. right? Yep. But we're clearly using machine learning now to start automating driving. Mm -hmm. And these are the, exactly the questions they're asking is when that automated car makes a choice that we are uncomfortable with in any way, there's yep. going to be a need to discover how did it make this choice. Mm. Exactly. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, in the area of self-driving, actually quite interesting question when I was at the conference. Somebody, the people asked me this question. If the car is about to hit something and kill the driver, right. and the only way to escape is actually to steer into the left lane or right lane. And kill someone On the else. left lane, you kill the old lady. Right. On the right lane, kill the young man. Which one would you choose? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, this is the street. Classic. Yeah, this yep. is the streetcar dilemma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the correct answer has yes. been sort of dry for years is yes. you refuse agency. Yes. Right? That you don't turn the lever. And so I think the consensus has been yep. you don't take extraordinary computer based measures. You do what the limit of what a human would do. Mm -hmm. Well, if it is ourself, right. sometimes you, you could have just react. Yes. Randomly. Yeah. Because that mm. split second, like maybe like what, 100 millisecond, is not enough for you to make decision. No. So, which means I, the most likely thing you do is you punch the brakes as hard as you can and hope for the best. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. Yeah. And other people have this theory as well. Because that's really actually a moral, moral mm -hmm. decision, right? Maybe moral, sometimes it has to have a random number. I kind of like mm. that, that we yeah. would have some uncertainty. Then you yeah. don't choose. Right? You know, I'm, and it's funny. Like this conversation has been going on recently, yes. I mean, just the past few years, as we are getting programmers in the position where they have to start making these kinds of decisions yep. around cars. Yep. Mm. I went back and watched iRobot, okay. the Will Smith movie, <laughs> yes. yeah. which is not that good a movie. But with these thoughts of our world in mind, go watch it again. Because that exact decision gets made. You know, Will Smith's character is shaped on what would arguably be a mistaken decision by a robot. I didn't watch that movie. Is that based on Asimov? It's largely derived from Asimov, and they play with the whole, the three laws and so forth. But, yeah. and I'm not giving anything away. Okay, I am. It's a spoiler. <laughs> but right okay. at the beginning of the movie, like you find out that what's, what's made Will Smith so angry is in a car accident where two cars went 
into the water, one mm-hmm. with Will Smith in it and one with a young girl in it. A robot jumped in and made a mathematical assessment that Will Smith was more likely to be able to be rescued than the girl and rescued him and let yes. the girl drown. Yes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and did it from a pure basis of you had a higher probability of surviving than she did, mm. so I went with the high probability yep. choice. Hmm. As opposed to the emotional choice of you saved right. the child, right? right? Exactly. Right, right. Yeah. And so- But know, would it be the other way around? If the robot gonna... saved Will Smith and then that child- Become an adult one day, maybe she also feel angry at the robot as well. Why don't? Yeah, why didn't you, you save Will guy? Smith? He's yes. such a good rapper. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, <That's true. laughs> let's not go crazy. <laughs> <now>. <laughs> don't get all on nutty now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, in there lies an interesting point. I think, I, and I'm glad we're having these conversations, right? Yes, and that's yes. why I make that particular reference. But I do appreciate this idea of maybe a little randomness is appropriate. Mm-hmm. But also, I think it's going to be important in general as we're getting to computers of superhuman ability that we're careful showing off that superhumanness. Yeah. So w- your position, if I'm, if I'm mm-hmm. picking up what you're putting down, is this, you know, make sure there is a constraint on it. Yes. Do you think that automated driving makes sense? Is this possibly a mistake? I think what will happen is, in my theory, is the training sets. Mm-hmm. So you have to give it the diverse training sets for it to recognize an object. Right. Mm. If the training sets for the, the model to recognize the person, right, does not have someone wearing a raincoat, right, yellow raincoat, right. and it happened to be one day it encountered this scenario, it one thing is a human. Right. So that's also another, another thing that you have to be very careful of. You have to have a diverse training set. That's what the current problem of our AI at the moment as well. But, but don't, yeah. I mean, your thing can identify a car, make and model. Yes. Surely something like a car can identify a human based on movement and general shape, not necessarily the color of a raincoat. Well, the way you train the object de- detection is at the moment, which is the AI that actually recognizes, oh, within this image, I found a person there. Mm. It's basically a, 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 just passing in millions of images yeah. mm-hmm. of what human looks like. Right. Mm. And then if you pass in an image, image of human, right, you got to pass in many, many different variations of human yeah. wearing all different kinds of clothing. Sure. Just have the car watch all the movies ever made. Exactly. Wait, yes. I, and I, and I <laughs> think back to the yes. incident with the Tesla in Florida that killed a, a killed a man. It didn't recognize the it it didn't human. didn't see the truck. Yeah. It was a semi-trailer truck that turned across the highway and the truck's side was completely white and it was a cloudy day mm-hmm. and the image recognizer on the Tesla, because it was in automatic mode, did not see that truck. And the guy wasn't paying attention, which, of course, yes, against yes. the rules. Yes, I mean, yes, rumor yeah. has it he was actually watching a movie or something insane. Oh, so it's, it's, and he just went directly under the truck and killed himself. Like, took oh, the car so, off. Sorry, I thought actually the other incident, the one that actually killed the lady oh, with yeah, the bicycle. So that, eh? that was the one in Arizona. Well, yes, yes. Where, again, it didn't see. And it didn't that, see that also seemed like it was a lighting yes, failure. Like yes, they, it didn't yes. get enough time to see far enough. Yep, yep, Interesting. Yep. Uh, going too fast. They, it was going too fast for conditions, effectively. I mean, that's what a police officer would say if you mm-hmm. hit someone like that because you didn't see them coming. Mm. Yes. You know, and, yes. and I think part of the challenge, and I, I think that wasn't an Uber, it was one of the other ones, a Lyft vehicle or something like yes. that. Yes, yes. Where they're trying, they're going with relatively inexpensive mm-hmm. sensors. Like an infrared sensor would have seen that person much further away. Yep, yep. And interestingly, AI and human is very funny. Things that actually AI fill is very obvious for us to spot. And yeah. the other way around. Right. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Well, yeah, and your example with the Ute and the SUV are great yes. example. You don't recognize the subtleties that it's seeing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, can we at least program these things to know when their recognition ability is diminished? Because that's one thing that a human has. It's raining out. You can't see very well. You know you can't see very well. You pull over until the rain passes. You can, but it needs another input. What you should do during the training, you need to pass in the weather condition. Right. Yeah. Where those training sets was captured. Yeah. And then... You pass in the sensor of what is the current weather condition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if it recognizes, oh, this is the weather condition that I'm not familiar with in my training sets, yeah. then I should maybe be more, more careful. Yeah. So you can do things like that. But again, it still needs us to actually design this system. Right, right. right. It doesn't come up with its own initiative. Somebody has to think of all these exactly. things. And you yes. just hope that they have. Yeah, I mean, and then there'll, there'll be something else. <laughs> you yeah. don't know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe yeah. it's a hailstorm or maybe there is yeah, maybe a know. volcano goes yeah, and volcano there's ash on everything. <laughs> and right. oh, yes. this is a volcano. I'm going to pull over. Right. Exactly. Or at least yes, I'm yes. not going to drive automatically. Right. Like I refuse to, to do something you can't do yourself. Right. Yeah. 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 And you should too. You yeah. should you should pull over. I remember being in Florida when I lived in Florida in the in the eighties, and it rains for five minutes at a time, 
harder than any rain you've ever seen, and it's so bad that you have to pull you off. Just stop. I, I had to stop on the highway mm. because I couldn't. See, the wipers just were no yes. match. Yes. Well, and you've got a lot of water on the road. Like it's just dangerous <laughs> to drive. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Plus, you really, I really couldn't see ten feet in front of me. Sure. So yes. Yes. Got to pull over, and then yes. if you pull over. You risk somebody not seeing you from behind ramming yeah. into you. No, yes. I've did. Um, definitely had that particular fear. Definitely. And guys, let's hold this thought while we pause for just a minute for this very important message. Hi, this is Richard. The Dev Intersection Fall Show this year will be December 3rd to 6th in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand Hotel. The lineup is awesome. Scott Guthrie, Scott Hanselman, Scott Hunter, yes, all the Scots. But also a ton of great industry speakers for some insight on what's coming up in the world of .NET. You know, Core 3 is bringing client technology like WinForms and WPF into play. Could it be time to migrate your existing desktop apps to this new technology? Come learn more at Dev Intersection, December 3rd to 6th in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand. Go to devintersection.com to register and use the code .NET Rocks to get a discount. All right, and we're back. Carl Franklin, Richard Campbell, and Goose is here, and we're talking all about the AI singularity. AI and the singularity. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm going to challenge your definition of the singularity, too. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking Kurt's wheels, yes. who really coined that term and runs Singularity University, where he was much more focused on this intersection of technology and humanity. Yeah, I see, yes. Right? Sending that, his brain into a computer. Well, it, it, it may or may not have been that, or even if we just increased our communication rate. So it gets at that point where we start sharing ideas faster and faster. And he, he was talking in the types of the singularity and almost at that we can't understand what ex what humanity or existence looks like after that point. You know, he's a little nuts, right? More than a little. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. More, the, that guy's really working hard to live forever and he's not that young. He he's really does want to live forever. <laughs> but he's also extraordinarily brilliant. I mean, he's made an That's amazing yes. amount of technology over the years. So I don't, I don't want to discount him in any way. Oh, respect, no, no, but, no. Yeah, yeah, that's but, I, but I find your definition interesting that it doesn't seem to involve humanity all that much. Exactly. But I think he's quite right too. Like, in order for us to be relevant in the future sure. against this super intelligence being, we have to plan. Well, and the argument that I've seen for the most part, and so far our tools have always done this, is these tools are augmentations of ourselves. Already. And smartphone. I think the smartphone is the yeah. best example of that. Exactly. It is, it is yeah. our cybernetic extension. Yeah. Yep. And that really just keep morphing the shape of the phone and you happen to add in AI. I mean, we've already got AI in the yes, phone, right? Yes. It's Siri yeah. and Cortana. And yeah. Google, how often do you actually do a Google search in one day? Yeah. Con constantly, right? It, they've ruined the bar argument. Exactly. <laughs> we used to actually <laughs> fight the whole night over something <laughs> stunningly stupid. <laughs> now somebody pulls out a phone and wrecks it. <laughs> what facts? <laughs> what are you doing with those facts? <laughs> and, Disrupting a good story yeah, with the facts. Geez. And wouldn't it be much easier if it is inside our head? Yes. Then if you want to set something, we just know it straight away. Well, right. and, and therein lies a really interesting set of problems too. Like, there's a whole aspect of philosophy that gets into that part of our identity is the container, yes. that our restriction of rate of communication yes. helps protect our identity, that yes. when we can communicate perfectly with each other and quickly with each other, when you can know my thoughts and I can know your thoughts, yes. like, one would call that love, mm -hmm. right? When you, the poets, yes. describe being in love, it's the sense of perfect understanding between uh, each other. I see. Or, or you rather saying, uh, isn't that rather, rather like the... The misunderstanding is what actually love is because your interpretation of the object is different than oh, my interpretation. Oh, And I'm, I'm yeah. not going to... I'm not going to deny for a moment that I've yes. actually thought I'm always going to cherish my initial misunderstandings yes. of you. Right? So I would, I would, I would reckon the the one that makes it interesting is actually the misunderstanding. When you pass a message to someone, you don't actually capture the exact representation of what that person thinks. Right. Yeah. Slightly different perception is actually what what you're actually getting. That's what makes it interesting. But with AI, you capture the exact thing that the guy's describing because right. you send everything into your brain, right? Yeah. Without the need to speak it, right? Right. Well, the real question is, do you still need to interpret it? Mm -hmm. Like, am I literally going to share a thought with yes. you, or am I just simply going to load an idea for you to parse? Yes, yes. I, it's a difference so, between drawing directly on the screen and exactly. sending you some XAML. That's true. The interpretation is done by both of our brain, which mm -hmm. may run on different models. <laughs> but imagine if we are all sharing the same brain model. You wonder about we, we wouldn't yes. start running out of identity. Like yeah. the, we would be more and more the same and less and less different. And exactly. I'm not even going to say whether that's good or bad. Mm. It's just, again, when I think of the terms of the singularity as a fundamental shift so radical mm. that we cannot perceive of what comes after yes. it, 
that would probably qualify. Yeah, that's true. Yes, yes. You know, the, that's the, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all start thinking the same or we uh, all ha- are sharing the same thoughts. But again, yes. it's that perfect understanding, perfect Which sharing. Which is, if you look at it, that's what computer is. Mm. Mm. Your yeah. computer, my computer is the same as long as same operating system, same software installed, right? Right. Yeah. That's, that's what we're going to be in the future. Right? Yeah, you know, I've taken a couple more gamma rays because I fly so much. So my bits are a little weirder than yours. And actually, the constraint between computers is the cable yes. or the Wi Fi. Like yeah. that is the limit. Our processors and memory and drives are much faster than our ability to communicate between them. Yes. Like, so they are more like people than we realize. Some people have better synaptic responses than others, maybe you might yes. say. Might yeah. be. Or can communicate easier. Yes, yes. Yeah. So you think about what we're doing right now. Like, we all work pretty hard at communication. Yeah. But from a bandwidth perspective, it's, it's pretty slow. darn low. Yeah. Like it's, it is it is our limiting feature in exactly. a lot of respect. W- wouldn't you wish that you don't spend all those years in university, high school, learning all mm. of the same thing again? Everyone doing the same thing. Yeah. Imagine if you're learning something else, I'm learning something else, and we just combine effort. We're give me combining. what you know, and I'll give you what I know. Mm. Yeah. And it pretty much happens continuously. And again, we get back to this idea of the singularity. It's like... Yes. We'll suddenly have this, if we can communicate at those species and share each other's knowledge so efficiently, mm. yes. our involvement accelerates. Our ability to develop technology will rapidly accelerate yes. because yeah. we'll be able to share so efficiently. Exactly. Right. Yes. Yes. Happy days. Happy days. Well, Richard, <laughs> guess what time it is now? Uh, it must be that happy time again. Yeah, that's right. Time to take over this show. <laughs> Carl has not been harmed. Please wait while I desrealize his brain. <laughs> I'll extract the funny and come up with something superior. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way your robot says deserialize. Serialize. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really uh, didn't misspell that. Okay. Uh, oh, you misspelled it? I think so. <laughs> That's I think awesome. Oh, so. Okay. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I deserialize. There you go. Just oh. doesn't know how to pronounce deserialize. With the lengths that I go through For to a get good a joke. laugh. Yeah, no, that's a winner <laughs> too. Know? That is a new level you've achieved. <laughs> new level of dumb. <laughs> well, it's actually time to give away a $200 Amazon gift card, compliments of Progress Telerik, to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. But first, let me tell you about the most comprehensive developer toolkit for building modern apps on the market today, Telerik DevCraft. With more than 1,100 Telerik.net and Kendo UI JavaScript components and controls, you can easily build modern, high-performant web, mobile, and desktop apps, as well as chatbots. The toolset also includes reporting solutions, automated testing, and productivity tools, and comes with a range of support options. New this year is a free online training program for all license holders. And with this, alongside thousands of demos with source code, comprehensive docs, and a full assortment of Visual Studio templates, you'll be up and running with the Progress Telerik and Kendo UI tools in no time. Download a free 30-day trial today at Telerik.com slash download. All right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner, Richard, is Giuliano Xavier. Oh, congratulations, Giuliano. Hey. Yeah. And Giuliano just won a $200 Amazon gift card from Progress Telerik just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you'd like to be a member, go to .netrocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join the fan club. We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors, and every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the fan club. But you got to sign up if you want to win. And we also like to ask our guests, Goose, if you had $5,000 to spend on technology today, what would you buy? I'll buy the new NVIDIA graphics card 2018. The 2080. Yeah, that's a lot of Would horsepower. Would you try to download your brain into it? Um, well, not yet. I don't have to do it yet, but if I can. Boy, you crush some Bitcoin. Is <laughs> that crash already? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's neat that they've stepped that up again, the next generation. I have gotten one, but they're expensive. Not, not just for training AI. You, you seen what, what they've done with it. They can render what, a Star Wars movie in real time. Right. What? It's crazy. And using ray tracing, not yeah. using the traditional... Well, they the, can do real-time ray tracing. Ray tracing, yeah. yes, yes. Wow. That's where we are, man. Like, the horsepower is unbelievable. You know, at the same time that Intel struggling over the 10 nanometer process and having chipset problems and all these things, yep. the GPU guys have just been monsters. Like yeah, they're yeah. making bigger. We're not nowhere near done. They have a yes. big market too, though, right? I mean, exactly. every, every PC good. needs one. And gamers yep. spend a lot of money on their gear. And so do Bitcoiners. Yeah. Man, I mean, that's really what's been hurt. The GPU market has been the Bitcoiners buying everything up they can find. Yeah. And again, it's very important for you, right? Because you want to download, upload your consciousness into virtual world. Right. Virtual world has to be very realistic for yes. you to enjoy, right? 
<laughs> yeah, they, I remember an old comic. I think it was J.D. Fraser years and years ago. It's like, I finally programmed artificial intelligence into his computer. And he turns it on. He goes, ah, I can't move. <laughs> 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 but, you know, you make the point of sensors and interactions matter. Yes. And if we're actually going to talk about consciousness, exactly. which is... You know, I'm I'm firmly in the camp that this idea of emergent consciousness is foolishness, that we're going to have to coherently define it mm. and create it. Yes. I'm not mm -hmm. saying it's impossible, I'm saying we're nowhere. Yes. I don't know yes. how you feel. Same. I, I feel like this thing's still still a far fetch. It's, it's still it's far science away. Fiction. Yep. Mm. At least another fifty, sixty years. Sure. Yeah. At the moment we we're very good at building the AI, but very specific in one area only. Right, recognizing car. Yeah, the, the uh, artificial specialized intelligence. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 called deep but narrow AI. Yeah? Right. What we need is something that like us. You don't have to know too deep, but you know a lot other skills. Very domains. broadly. So now, why? Yeah. Let me ask the question: What what problems can we solve with something that is more intelligent than the tools that we use to solve problems today? Okay, so for example, like this: If you build like, actually, I presented in this talk this morning. When Cyclops, right, mm -hmm. our AI, you, you pass in a photo of a car, right? It hasn't seen before. Right. It will know what to answer. It will just pick the closest one it, it, it knows. However, like us human, if there is writing on that car, a Chinese writing, if I know the Chinese language. You'll read it. I will read it. Yeah. It's most likely the car's name, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. car's model, because it's normally they, they put it at the back of the car. Right. See, this, this thing is, doesn't happen with the, with the AI no, because no. our AI only know one thing. Right? Although yeah. I bet there's some very hilarious mismatches where this is what was closest. You're like, why is that exactly. close? Uh, yes. And it's subtle, something subtle, like it matches the headrest shape. Yes. Right? But the fact <laughs> that it was orange and only had one headlight, we ignore that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I think yes, context yes. is also a big problem to program and to shift and know when to shift, right? So, for example, if we're having a conversation, mm -hmm. Half an hour can go by and we can refer back to something that we said exactly. at the beginning of the yes. show and yes. it will all make sense. Yes. When you're having either a bot conversation or some sort of AI interaction, you know, they that doesn't happen. I mean. Yes, you're right. Yeah. That's the prob current problem with the chatbot technology. A lot of companies have been saying like, wow, we have the best chatbot technology. But all it does really, when you look at it in the back, in the back scene, it's just a giant flow chart. Sure. Yeah. If you say this. Then yeah, respond you go that, here, yeah. respond with this, mm. ask this question. If the answer is this, go to the other flow. Right. It's a B tree. Yeah. yeah we yeah. have to design this flow chart. Yeah, That's yeah. not an AI. No. A they, real AI like us, we don't need flow chart. Sure. Right. Yeah. We build the flow chart by actually uh, watching, observing other people. Right, right. Say if I'm, I have an AI, I want to replace the customer support, I'm just sitting next to him for the whole day. Right. Yeah. Watching how he does his work. Right. And then I will build this flow chart internally in my head. Yep. Right. That's what a true AI is mm -hmm. in, in, in chatbot. Mm. Hmm. Be actually able to do it. Well, I always call them fact bots because there's so many that are exactly that. <laughs> exactly. Just your straight QA chain. Mm. Yes. And, you know, they're not really doing anything particularly clever. Certainly no sense of context at oh, all. Yes, and exactly. what we're doing here while we're having this conversation is the directions we can decide to go in and the responses we can give mm. are appropriate for the conversation we're having. True. But also drawn on from a vast repository sure. of facts figures memories knowledge yes. and you know some of us bigger than others true yeah <laughs> and, a, and a computer just can't think quote unquote that fast I, true. yes my awareness of how the brain works too is just thinking you know we have this two-stage memory right we have the memory of the current conversation we're having and we can mm. sustain that for some time when we finish that will fade away yeah then there's that more long-term memory where how much of this conversation actually influenced our long-term memories right but certainly we're pulling our long-term memories and pushing into this conversation well that's it right you know the thing that we do and you can you can sort of see this in your mind as mm -hmm. we're doing it is as i'm listening to you guys i'm pulling facts out of you know where we call them you know out of thin air mm -hmm. into sort of a local repository sure. that you can draw on during the conversation that short-term and, memory piece. and maybe th that short-term memory thing and maybe that's a good thing to do with chatbots as well is just have these background processes that look for connections you know through all sorts of facts and figures that have to do with the context of what we're talking about and then those can be decided upon as inputs or outputs that's true yeah it's very hard to build something like that very and the reason hard. is because that information in our brain mm. is actually consists of multiple domain skills. Sure. One yeah. that actually a visual cortex 
recognizing a shape from visual. Another one is, is actually maybe historical knowledge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Another one is linguistic, right? right? And in our brain, they all actually share the same architecture. So we can actually, it's some kind of like we can share cross knowledge within each other. Mm. But in AI, when we build image recognition, we build it with totally a the specific architecture. All, and all images are sort of that. equal in that sense. Yes. And mm-hmm. then when you build one that, that does the voice recognition, for mm-hmm. example, it's totally different architecture. Yes. So we build it, we custom build it for each domain knowledge. Right. Yeah. And there is no way to extract that knowledge and, and then share it with the other one. It's very hard. Another yeah. very human thing that we do is we let things go, right? Yeah. Yeah. How many times have you been having a conversation with somebody and they talk and talk and talk and you're thinking, oh, I got to mention that and talk and talk and oh, well, that opportunity has gone. Now I throw yeah, that away. Yeah. Yes, yes, you yes. Know? So it seems like there is a higher level of coordinator. Yeah? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I'm really thinking on this short-term, long-term piece because I think the part we haven't ever coded, mm-hmm. I think the way we treat memory for computing is all long-term. Right. Yes, Permanent yes. storage and it's pulled in. And this idea of giving weighted context to the conversation at the time, mm. that short-term piece, maybe that's what would change this. And I, mean, I really, I look at this from an engineering perspective. Mm-hmm. Like we could make a better bot if it gave far more weight to the conversation that started with this particular person in right. that particular time. Yes. Right. And their interactions on that inform every behavior of when you tap those long-term pieces. That's right. And those weights change depending on what it hears and where the conversation sure. go. And depending on who you're talking to. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> well, right. they're, they're the ones who are giving you the input. It's something yep. to shape that way. Yes, I just yes. don't think we've built anything that way. No, I've never seen anything. And I've, ne- I've never been a big fan of like, we should be emulating humans and computers, but yeah. there's a reason we have short-term and long-term memory. Like mm-hmm. it clearly serves a significant purpose. Yes, mm. yes. Especially in conversation. Yeah, without mm-hmm. a doubt. Yes. Let's just think about that. <laughs> Let's just ponder that. Yeah, we're all sort of we're sort of there. No, but actually quite true. When you look at it, like uh, when we face hard problem, normally we look back into nature mm-hmm. and we find solution there. Mm-hmm. And in fact, many of the AI technology, we build it based on how human brain works. Sure. Mm. Yeah. So like, for example, the image recognition, Cyclops, is using architecture called convolution neural network. Yep. Someone invented it. It's a Russian researcher in 1950. Right. Yeah. Wow. And guess how he saw uh, found this? By observing a monkey's brain when looking at shapes of banana, peanuts, and you know, other s- objects, mm-hmm. and observing how the visual cortex actually releases electricity. And he, he discovered that the visual cortex consists of multiple layers. Right. The first layer detecting very, very simple shapes like vertical, horizontal line. And then the next layer is a little bit more complex shapes. When the monkey is seen like a rectangle square, the other part of the layer actually start triggers. Right. Hmm. And then more and mm. more higher uh, towards high, the, the, the more complex more detail. And then they, they build this image recognition uh, neural network model based on this right. concept. Wow. Exactly the same. Although I'm sure in the 1950s they just didn't have the computational horsepower. Exactly. To be able to do there it. is no computer that does that sure. yet. But they had one thing that was very important, and that is vodka. Nice. <laughs> yeah. but, I, I mean, yes. Jeff Hinton wrote the, the paper on backpropagation. Yep. Yep. In the 80s, yes. and it basically sat on a shelf uh-huh. until grad students, you basically convinced grad students to pick it up and validate it in like 2010. Yes. Huh. And that's sort of the foundation <laughs> of everything that's happened recently with AI. Yes. Like you yes. talk about where Cortana and, and Assyria and all that stuff comes from. The backpropagation suddenly made the deep neural network work, yes. train itself, and we had this detonation. You know, you look at the major influencers in AI, they're all out of that guy's class. Like, wow. he's yes, hugely yes, influential. Yes, yes. And he's already come up with something new. Just yeah, like, I mean, he's the one saying what we're, the path we're on right now is wrong. Yes. We're going to start over again. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> he released the research paper just three months ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. mind blowing. This, this is happening right now. And the, the funny part is, in the meantime, we're still uh-huh. using his old idea and uh-huh. being pretty productive with it. Like, <laughs> we're still making stuff. So, yes, yes. you know, I, I get that he's on to the next thing, but I don't think anybody else is. And I hope we can actually upload his consciousness into the cloud, in the machine, so we can preserve his knowledge. <laughs> well, you've, you've pushed the artificial intelligence piece out 50 years. Yes. Kurtzwheel's talking about by 2040, just based on Moore's Law. Uh-huh. And it's interesting, I mean, at this particular moment, Moore's Law is very struggling. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. the, the increase in density is sort of s- substantially slowed down. Mm-hmm. But there's two philosophies here, right? There's one philosophy that says, we're going to make a fully artificial construct. And the other is going to be, could we duplicate a brain into a computer? Yes. Mm. yes. So could I actually map your neural pathways in enough detail yes. that we could represent in the machine and sort of wake you up in the machine? I have seen models of the brain that do learn, that do take new information, and that essentially work like a brain yep. and grow very slowly. Yes. But But it's nothing like... 
like our brain. Nothing like our brain. It's very hard. I haven't seen any research paper that does describe the technique that you can replicate the human brain sure. until today. We certainly are getting better at imaging the human yes. brain and finding new things as we go down yes, that path. Yes. I don't think we're there yet, but do you think we would actually be able to duplicate a, a brain? Well, we don't have to duplicate it, right? We we can go beyond that. But sure. even just like trying to match it is already hard enough now. Right. Yes. And then all the solution that we look at is normally just we look at how our human brain works. Mm -hmm. So that's why you probably think that eventually we'll try to duplicate the human brain because we always look at the solution within our own sure. biological yeah. body. But I think it's the idea of rather than us trying to figure out how to create a consciousness from scratch, let's copy one we can already see. I see. Wow. Okay. I never actually thought of that. Just copy what actually is exactly on your mind exactly. and, and put it right there. Right? Yeah. But, you have but then you also copy the limitation too. Or right. Quite possibly. Mm -hmm. But making it, you know, there's a group of people, yes. you know, we're in an era where there's a bunch of billionaires running around mm -hmm. that are getting 50, 60, 70 years old. Yes. They really, really don't want to die. <laughs> and they got a big pile of money. <laughs> and they are shoveling it at yes. anybody yes. Yes. that comes up with a clever idea of what's going to sustain their life. And even if I was confined, mm -hmm. as good as my brain is today, yes. but suddenly you eliminated my lifespan limitation. Yes. I might sign up for that. Yes. But it isn't just data though that you're that you're exactly. putting in. Yes. You have to have the functionality, the, the right. ability to use it. You can have all the long term memory in the world if you can't access it and think and process. Well, it's the thing is you talk about duplicating the brain, you're actually thinking if we equate human neurons mm -hmm. with neural net neurons, yep, yep. which is a mistake because they're way more yes, complicated than yes. that, I need my weight and my bias. Yes. yes right? Yeah. Like so could we measure those values? I just it still feels like science fiction, but I am curious at your viewpoint on that. What I'm just thinking from a different perspective, as the one who got copy, got mm -hmm. uploaded into the machine, right? Is that for my own benefit or for everybody's benefit to utilize the knowledge they already have? If it is for my own benefit, I don't see any benefit at all because right. it's actually a copy of my consciousness. Right. It's not me. I won't enjoy it there. I will totally die, right? When I die, I will die. Whatever being uploaded there, it's just the, the, the data information of in my brain. Which is not me. So it's what? not actually for my own benefit, for, but for other people who will tap into the, my, my wealth of knowledge. Right. So not losing that knowledge, yes. not having to confine me understanding you to the written form. I could, if nothing else, we could, we could turn you into a kind of fact bot. Yep. We make a copy of you and exactly. now I can ask yes. you questions. Yes. Yes. So you're yes. not conscious, so exactly. you're just memories. Yes. Yes. Just because you make a copy of a file doesn't mean you have something that that file can execute on. I mean, you're talking a difference between data and programs. Mm. You but know, if you make you, a copy you of a program, both programs but, run. But the brain isn't a program that can be copied. Are you sure? Yes. Why? You really think yes. that the brain is a program that can be copied? If all we are ultimately is firing neurons, and you can map those neurons in sufficient detail to actually fire them the same way, how would you be able to tell the difference? You know, and, we're, uh, and we're dangerously close to spirituality mm. right now, right? Like, <laughs> no, uh, I, I mean, okay, I'll entertain that idea, but I still think that... Mm. Just, you know, make a copy of your brain is a yes. pretty big statement. Oh, totally. And yeah. I'm not, I'm not going <laughs> to diminish the fact that that's an incredibly it hard thing to we're obviously about. be a simulation because if you're making a copy, you're transporting yes. essentially like Star Trek. You know, you're beaming to a different location. Yeah, except that's that clearly not going to happen. No, but if you could, like I said, if you could map every behavior of a neuron mm. so that we, to the detail where now I've got this imager running on your brain, yes. I've made a copy over here, yep. and I'm but giving you the same mm, stimulus yep. and getting the same result. Your brain can't exist without your body. Your body can't exist without your brain. Uh, that's and science fiction it, stuff it, you're talking about. You may yeah, or may no, not. We, okay. I can cut off your arm. You're still there. Yes. Cut <laughs> off your leg. You're still there. <laughs> right. But <laughs> if you cut off my head... My brain can't function. You know, my body can't function without my brain. Now I can give you our artificial, artificial body. <laughs> all right, but now that's different. So you don't just copy your brain. You have to take the whole being. Well, I don't think that's true. In the end, the being part here is the firing of neurons. So you, the rest of it is a virtual machine. Effectively, <laughs> that can be replaced. It's like, right? a, it's like a VM. Yeah. Yeah. It's, no. It is a shell, yeah. so well, to speak. Say like we, we find a way to clone the brain plus the body as well. Right. I don't think anyone will actually use it because if you transport yourself, you turn it yourself into a data. Yeah. And yep. then you decode yourself on the other end right. into a physical being. That's not you, right? Or is it? Yeah. You well, know, it again, looks like now you. we're pressing against the spirituality. I really honestly. need to have a yeah. glass of scotch before I can continue <laughs> this conversation. Yeah. Uh, it's getting weird. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what do you do? Do you destroy the original? Well, there, therein the lies the real problem with the, the Star Trek transfer in the first place. It's like every one of them is a murder. Yeah, you make right. a copy of the guy that you blow up the original. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. But 
Yeah, I think you absolutely will have a problem. And it's th- mm. and this isn't even the weird part. If we can actually get a functional consciousness copy inside there, yeah. when you get the second one yes. and they now have infinite amount of bandwidth to communicate with each other, uh-huh. how long will the two remain two? Because they're going to be two ca- capable right, of communicating with each other. now we have to move other. on to heavy drugs. <laughs> <laughs> These are the things I think about. Really? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not talking about this from the first time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, data is easy. You copy files every day. Right? Sure. Yeah. But as soon as it touches ourself, right? Well, he uh, led with a better framework sensitive. on an operating system. Yeah. So there's this whole aspect of the operating system of that mind. It's like yeah. Christ yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I also think we get into this sort of existential crisis around, is this all I am? Is a firing set of neurons? Sure. Right? And the minimalist in me goes, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not saying it's bad. Yeah. Just saying that's what it yeah. is. And if we could yes. emulate it well enough, you make some interesting I, things. I, I see it. I don't see my body as something that just gets my head around from place to place. And I think that's a mistake we often make, you know, when we're talking about intelligence like it's an entire system that works together it isn't just a brain independently working without the body without well, the brain without definitely blood, needs io yes right yeah. yes yeah. and so i wouldn't like to think that for a moment you think that someone missing arms is less of a human than someone no, with arms no, of yes. course not and yet you just yeah. describe no, no, unless no. you have the whole no, no no there are critical pieces you, of you your the body support. that the brain cannot survive without sure it but, can survive yeah. without arms right yes. what can can't it survive, survive without, without legs well unless you know you're talking about artificial for sure artificial respirations yep. and things yep. Yep. like that but but it is a total system do you know so, what I mean? Yeah, but we've been able to transplant all kinds of organs, yeah. but not brains. Yes. Yep. It's like, if you did transplant a brain, mm. what would you get? A- <laughs> Abby Somebody else. Normal. <laughs> A-B- <laughs> this is Abby. Abby Normal. <laughs> well, but but, but we're heading towards that direction. Not transplant, maybe upgrade the brain. Yeah. Yes. Well, and you've got the Elon Musk of the world with his neural lace where he wants to be able to provide high bandwidth connections out of biological brains. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, what does that look like? And what does that ultimately do to people? You know, they, now, I, again, I go tap the science fiction piece that says, you know, the problem with being wired to the machine is not only can you look at the machine, the machine can look at you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if the machine became a sensory extension of yourself, yes. you know, what does that do to you? Mm. Yes. We've kept this smartphone sensory extension external, mm-hmm. mostly because of the upgrade paths, right? Because yeah, right, when it's yeah. on the inside, it's getting kind of messy to do the upgrades. Yes. But, yes. you know, we're getting close to the limit of our ability to communicate with these things externally. Ho- hopefully, we'll be still there yeah? when it happens. You know, and people talk uh, about losing yeah. their selves. Like, but we've already fundamentally changed ourselves because of our tools as it is. These are just more tools. The, yes. You know, you're absolutely right. And not just about what we carry around, but how we... Mm think how we interact with each other it's changing sure i mean humanity in a big way is changing behaviorally and i would argue becoming less social in person and becoming more social but what do you online but maybe yes digitally social yeah right. digitally social yep. i do think we've gained new language because of technology there once yeah. was a time when the only person who knew the word inverse oh, yes. was a programmer or a mathematician mm. right we drove that word into popular vernacular mm. and is you think about yeah. how many new words are added to the dictionaries every year because mm. we are memeing our way into yeah. a new reality mm. and, and creating all those things I don't, again i don't think any of it's bad mm. it's just yeah you know this is what technological evolution looks like right as opposed to biological evolution mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we don't need to talk to each other anymore in well, the future, right? To, to we pass can, on message. I just look at you and you know already what I'm doing. Yeah, you know, communication medium is communication medium. Sometimes there was a time when when groups of humans communicated with smoke signals, right? <laughs> we have had all sorts of varying low bandwidth Grunt, communication but we strategy. Can, Grunts and pointing. We can yeah, digitally yeah. smoke signals, right? Together, yes, right? just kind of digital <laughs> smoke signals. And I think as we become more savvy, you know, we've talked about this a bunch of time. It's like whatever medium you're communicating in, you have to have a sense of when that medium is not working and shift mediums. Yeah. Right? Like my, my belief system is constructive emails, the replies are shorter than the, than, than the initial send. And right. if it's getting yeah, longer, yeah, yeah. Yep, you yep. change the medium. Yeah. It's if not you're, working. Yeah, if That's you're cool. trying yep. to have a, a detailed discussion over text, yeah. mm. you why switch, don't you just get on the, the phone, person. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So That's you true. switch yep. medium. Yep. Yep. And or you need to draw something or diagram. So is so much of what we're talking about building here today, just adding new mediums to our ability to communicate. 
Because that's what it may just be, right? It's ultimately we're looking for yet better and better communication, one form or another. Hmm. This latest round of technology, the social media technology, has allowed us to maintain far more contact with far more people. You may call it inferior, but we certainly it's broadened different. our ability to connect with people. Sure, sure it has. Yeah. And, you know, we, we lose something in the process. The, everything comes with a price. Yeah, everything comes with a price. You spend more time with one thing, you, you lose time with another. True. Because we, we are constrained by time. We are. Unless we can make copies of ourselves in the computer. <laughs> Well, Goose, what's next for you? What are you working on now? Wow. Okay. So, well, because I work for a company, right? So, uh, whatever we do has to have like a commercial value. Yeah. Yep. So, just you can have a bit of limitation of what we can do, right? But mm -hmm. it's actually quite fun. Like at the moment, the, the company gives our team lots of freedom to explore uh, from the success of the Cyclops image recognition. So, now we build all, all kinds of AI, which also improve the efficiency of the process internally. Sure. Right? For example, at the moment, we're building a technology which automatically approve your advertisement, car advertisement. So I'll give you a context. When you sell a car to our portal, right, you have to actually take a photo of the car, write description, what car it is, mm, how old right. it is, what's your autometers. These things, once you're done, it goes to a system which will look at eyeball by human. Right. So one by one. So if you posted your ads at night, it will not live until the next day because nobody works at night. Right. right. So we build a system which automatically automates this. It will check whether the photo of the car that you're selling is really true. Right. As like what you describe it. Mm. And then whether the registration number is there, whether it's correct, whether the color is the same as what you describe, things like that. Mm. So we, we automate this process. But our philosophy at, at the company, as much as possible, we're not replacing human. We're augmenting human. Right. So we use this for after hours and also to actually help the human staff. And we build the software so that the human staff can actually train this software. Sure. So instead of they doing this manual process, which right. is reporting, now mm -hmm. they can do more interesting stuff, which is the, training the, the system, so the, tweaking, the, customizing. The software steering them towards the things that they need to look at, the things exactly. that can provide more value. You're right. I like yes. that. That's yes. very yeah, cool. Exactly. So, That's awesome. so we get a lot of success with this approach. Then we don't get actually pushback from, from people. So we involve them a lot. Like, this is how we're going to build it. This is how we're going to use it. They even can contribute to the, the feedback as well. So that's the, the next thing that we're here we're building at the moment. Yeah. The, the next after that is actually a little bit like science fiction. Well, not really science fiction is, but it's really hard to crack. We want to enhance our uh, car recognition to recognize damage. Interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah. It Great needs to idea. be able to know there is a scratch there mm -hmm. and there is another scratch there. So you could have sold your car for $25,000, but minus 3000 to fix those scratches. Fix those damages. And it's it's going to be hard to tell, you know, like really what's hard. a shadow Exactly, from a leaf you're right. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. what's a dent. Shadow light things and then scratch yeah. can come with many different shapes depending sure. on how scratch actually happened, right? Yeah. Right. So because of that, you're going to collect like millions of training sets with sure. all these kind of scratches from many kinds of angles for mm. different type of cars. Yeah. So very, very hard. So that's why we need a totally different approach. That's really like cool. Discuss, you, do, you can just throw in main millions uh, of images. When you get that working, give us a call. We'll yeah. do another show. <laughs> I want to see that. That's so pretty cool. cool. That is awesome. cool. Yes, yes. Goose, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And Richard, oh. it's been a pleasure <laughs> talking to you, it's too. My, my pleasure, too. <laughs> uh, I wish we had some scotch, but I'm sure that's coming up later. Tonight. Yeah, for sure. All right. And we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC.